In single variable calculus, you have a, a bunch of rules that help you turn complicated derivatives into easier derivatives. So you had a linearity, which said that you could split up sums and pull out constants, the product rule, the quotient rule, and the chain rule. Um, oh, and the power rule. Um, in this section, we want to look at similar rules for multivariable functions, at least in terms of gradient vectors first, and um, in the later part of the section, the more depth part, in terms of total derivatives and differentials. Um, the linearity, the, the product rule, the quotient rule, the power rule, all of those will follow quickly from the uh, single variable versions. But the multivariable chain rule is really something new and different. It does not follow quickly from the single variable chain rule, so we'll spend most of the time on that, but do everything in terms of of gradient vectors and partial derivatives in this first basic uh, portion of the section. Um, all right, so um, recall from, from Calc 1 that if you had something like, I guess I want a specific example, if you had something like 3x to the fifth minus 7 sine of x and you want the derivative, the you quickly, you probably do this without thinking at this stage. You can just kind of separate the subtraction, uh, split up sums and differences and pull out constants and immediately reduce this to taking three times the derivative of x to the five minus seven times the derivative of sine. And of course, then you have to know the derivatives of raising x to the fifth power and, and the derivatives of sine of x, but the point I'm trying to make now is that you split up sums and differences and pull out constants. That's referred to as linearity, so the linear property of differentiation. And it means that you can take this complicated looking expression and if you want to calculate its derivative, you can, it, you just quickly reduce it to knowing these two more basic derivatives. Um, linearity for multivariable functions. If you've got um, f and it's a function of many variables, well, you have linearity for each partial derivative because partial derivatives are derivatives with respect to a single variable. But then if you do that to all the partial derivatives, you get linearity for gradient vectors. So if you've got two functions, f and g, of the same variables, and you want the gradient vector of some scalar, some constant multiple of f, some constant or scalar multiple of g, then you can just split up sums and differences and pull out constants. So this is, you get a times the gradient vector of f plus b times the gradient vector of g. So it says what you'd expect it to say. Um, let's do a quick example. Oh, let's suppose you have the gradient vector of f at 3, 5, minus 7. Suppose this is 2, 9, 1 and the gradient vector of g at 3, 5, minus 7 is minus 1, 0, 4. Then you could be asked for the gradient vector of 3f minus 2g at, well, the only point where you have any data, 3, 5, minus 7. So 3, 5, minus 7. And then what do you get? Well, you just split up the difference and pull out the constants. You get um, three times the gradient vector of f, evaluated at 3, 5, minus 7, minus two times the gradient vector of g at 3, 5, minus 7. And this is three times, well, you were given the gradient vector of f at exactly that point, so three times 2, 9, 1, minus 2 times minus 1, 0, 4. 
and this is 6, 27, 3, and then I'm going to distribute the minus sign, so plus a 2, 0, negative 8, and so I get 8, 27, minus 5. All right, so that's simple. Um, maybe something I should say. Uh, I just did this twice in this example and in that one with a minus sign here. That's because this b could be negative, and then if you add negative g, that's, I mean, if you add a negative something times g, that you can just distribute the minus sign. But if it looks better to you, you could put a plus or minus here and a plus or minus here. You split up sums or differences and pull out constants. All right. Um, what about the product rule? So that was linearity. What about something like the product rule? I said the product rule. Well, remember how the product rule looks for a function of a single variable. So if f is just f of a single variable x, and g is g of a single variable x, then the derivative of f times g, remember it is not just the derivative of f times the derivative of g. I usually say the first thing times the derivative of the second, plus the second thing times the derivative of the first. So, that. What is it for multivariable functions? Well, so now f is a, is a function of some multi-indexed, multi something with multiple components. It could still be single variable, but we want to allow for the multivariable case. Well, what happens? The partial derivatives are still derivatives of a function of a single variable. You're differentiating with respect to one of them. So for any one of the xi's, the partial derivative with respect to xi of f times g, it's just the ordinary product rule, but with partial derivative, derivatives in it. It's the first thing times the derivative of the second, plus the second thing times the derivative of the first. But if you do this to each component, um, if you use each component function, xi, what you quickly conclude then is that what is the gradient vector of f times g, it is the first thing, and then you think times the derivative of the second, but it's gradient vector, all of the partial derivatives at once, plus the second thing times the derivative of the first you get this formula for the product rule. And what this means is at a point P, you would have f of P, the gradient vector of g at P, plus g of P times the gradient vector of f at P. So this is the product rule for gradient vectors. Um, so let's look at an example. Let's look at a fairly complicated example. Let's calculate the gradient vector of x squared y plus the cosine of z times z ln of y plus the square root of x. That, yuck. All right. Let's do this. Um, it's not particularly bad. Uh, you will, as in single variable calculus, want to change the square root of x to x to the 1 half in order to differentiate it easily. Aside from that, you just apply the, the product rule. It's the first thing, the first function, times the gradient vector of the second one. I'll do this in steps. 
So with the gradient vector of z ln of y plus x to the 1 half plus the second thing, z ln of y plus the square root of x times the gradient vector of the first thing. Okay, so that was the product rule, but we, now we actually have to calculate this gradient vector and this gradient vector. And you do that, you get, so this part doesn't change, x squared y plus the cosine of z. Then the gradient vector, all right, it is the partial derivative with respect to x. So you get 1 half x to the minus 1 half, comma, the partial derivative with respect to y, you get z times 1 over y, times the partial derivative with respect to z, you get ln of y. And then, plus this other part, we can't forget this part, plus a z ln of y plus x to the 1 half times the gradient vector of this part. So the vector, the partial derivative with respect to x, 2xy, the partial derivative with respect to y, x squared, and the partial derivative with respect to z minus the sine of z. This is what you get. You get this scalar function. So this just gives you back a real number multiplied times this vector plus this scalar function multiplied times this vector. Should you combine those and write it as just one vector, something, comma, something, comma, something? No. Uh, I wouldn't, unless there's some very good reason to do so. If you could see an easy simplification, maybe. Um, but this looks like a mess. And really, for calculating later, it's probably best separated like this for ease of calculation. It would look like a big mess if you multiplied this times each component here, multiplied this times each component here, and then added. Uh, this is the, the nicest way to write it, um, unless you see some quick cancellation. All right, um, let's look at um, a quotient rule example. Well, let's look at the quotient rule and then a quotient rule example. So the quotient rule, again, you know what this says for single variable functions. It says if you have if you have functions of a single variable and you want the derivative, it's the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Of course you need of course, you need for f and g to be differentiable, so those derivatives exist, and you need for g not to be zero, so that dividing by g, both in what you're starting with and in what you end up with, is defined. But aside from that, this is what you get. Um, what do you do for multivariable functions? It's probably what you would guess. Every time you see derivative, you have the gradient vector instead. And how do you prove this? It's you just once again, it's just every partial derivative is a derivative with respect to a single variable. So this is true for partial derivatives. And if you do them for all the partial derivatives and write in vector form, what you get is hopefully what you'd expect. That the gradient vector of f over g is, it's the bottom times, think, derivative of the top. That's the gradient vector of the top minus the top times the gradient vector of the bottom all over the bottom squared. So it says that. Um, so it looks the same except where you had derivative before you have the gradient vector. So the vector of all the partial derivatives. So what's an example? Just make up any 
example that you want. So, but the first one that's in the book, y squared inverse tan of x over y minus x cubed at the point where x, y is 1, 5. Okay, so we want to calculate this gradient vector. Use the quotient rule with gradient vectors in it with, and with a general x and y in it. In the end, you plug in x, y equals 1, 5. So this is what we're after. So first you calculate it with just arbitrary x and y in it. You get, all right, so the quotient rule, it is bottom, I think, times the derivative of the top, but derivative means gradient vector. Or you should, or it doesn't mean that. I'm just, in place of derivative, you should think gradient vector. The bottom times the derivative of the top, the gradient vector, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, but really gradient vector of the bottom. all over the bottom squared. So we still need those two gradient vectors. So we get y minus x cubed, and then the partial derivative with respect to x. All right, have to remember, the derivative of inverse tan of x with respect to x, 1 over 1 plus x squared. So the partial derivative of this with respect to x, you get y squared over 1 plus x squared, comma, the partial with respect to y, 2y inverse tan of x, minus y squared inverse tan of x, the gradient vector of y minus x cubed, partial with respect to x, minus 3x squared, partial with respect to y, 1, and then all over the denominator squared. Yuck, <laughs> that looks pretty bad, uh, but it's not like it was difficult. You just use the quotient rule, the bottom times the gradient of the top minus the top times the gradient vector of the bottom all over the bottom squared, um, and then you had to calculate we had to calculate those two gradient vectors. All right. Um, but we're supposed to evaluate at 1, 5. Let me not rewrite this. I'm just, I'll put in 1 and 5 every place. So x is 1. And y is 5. So I will get 5 minus 1 cubed. That's 1. Uh, let me not. Okay. I won't put it in this intermediate one. Let me put this back. Uh, so yeah, this at 1, 5. I'm just going to put it in the final one that we had here. All right, so now let's do this again. y is 5. x is 1. y is 5, so this is 25. x is 1, so x squared is 1, so this denominator is a 2. y is 5, so this is 10. The inverse tan of 1. You should know the inverse tan of 1. You should think, oh, it's uh, some angle between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 whose tangent is 1. That would mean sine equals cosine. You should think, oh, 45 degree angle, but we need radian, so it's pi over 4. Um, inverse tan of 1, pi over 4. And then y is 5, so this is 25. This is the inverse tan of 1. So that's 25 times pi over 4. x is 1, so this is minus 3, 1. y is 5. x is 1. So x cubed is 1. So you get this, and you can simplify. I won't, but you can. This is 4. You I, you could go ahead and write this as one vector. It wouldn't be so bad. 
Um, this is four. You could multiply that four times each of these. Um, then you get, you can distribute or multiply that inside those components. Here's this four squared. So you could, there's a one over 16. Anyway, you can simplify this. I won't, but this is what you get. All right. So that's the quotient rule for gradient vectors. There's only one other simple one. It's the power rule. And then we'll do the chain rule, which is the really new complicated thing. So the power rule, and there's a specific example I want of that also. This power rule is really um, a combination of the power rule for single variable functions and the chain rule for single variable functions. It's just the, the gradient vector of a multi-index function that's raised to a power, so alpha is an arbitrary real number, the gradient vector, so f is a multivariable function, and then alpha is a real number. And if you have f raised to that power, and then you want the gradient vector, you just do the power rule that you would have from single variable calculus, alpha f to alpha minus 1, times the gradient vector of f. Of course, you need for f to the alpha minus 1 to exist. So for instance, if, if alpha minus 1 is negative, you need for f not to be 0. You need the gradient vector to exist. But when those exist, this calculation is correct. So an example of this, suppose h at 371 is 4, and the gradient vector of h at 371 is minus 8, 0, 4. And we would like to calculate the gradient vector of the square root of h at the only point where we have any data, 3, 7, 1. So we'd like to do that. All right. What do you do? You rewrite the square root of h as h to the 1 half and use the power rule. So um, what is the gradient vector of the square root of h? Well, that's the gradient vector of h raised to the 1 half power. And the power rule says that this is 1 half h to the minus 1 half times the gradient vector of h. So the gradient vector of the square root of h evaluated at the point 3, 7, 1 is uh, h to the minus 1 half is 1 over the square root of h, so it is 1 over 2 times the square root of h times the gradient of h, where all of this is evaluated at 3, 7, 1. Well, this is 1 over 2 times h at 3, 7, 1 is 4. So, um, so this is 2 times the square root of 4 times the gradient vector of h at 371, which you were given as minus 8, 0, 4. So this is 1 over 2 times 2, so that's 1 fourth. And now I really would multiply that times that. It divides each of these components by 4. So you get minus 2, 0, 1 for the answer. Quick, easy. Um, all right, those are kind of the, the easy rules for calculating gradient vectors of multivariable functions um, when you've got kind of products, quotients, powers, linear combinations. But now we come to the chain rule. And the chain rule for multivariable functions is uh, very different looking. 
I want to start with kind of an example with enough variables in it that it kind of lets you see what's going on in general. Then I'll give the general statement, and then we'll look at three or four examples. So, <clears throat> first, you should recall the chain rule from single variable calculus. So, so from single variable calculus, what happened? You had f is some function of some variable, so you call it x. But x itself is a function of some other variable, t. And then that means that if you plug this in, substitute in what x is in terms of t, you can write f as a function of t. And then you could ask, then, what's the derivative of f with respect to t? And the chain rule in this Leibniz notation with the d's just looks like algebraic cancellation of fractions. That is not, they are not fractions. That is essentially what's going on in the proof. In the proof, you do get a delta x and a delta x, and it is, they're canceling, but um, essentially. But cancellation of, algebraic cancellation of fractions makes the chain rule in this form easy to remember. It looks like the dx is canceling. You get df dt. The other form, so this is one way of writing the chain rule. The other form of the chain rule, written in the notation with the primes, it's what you're really looking at when you consider f as a function of t is the composition of the two functions. You do x of t and then you do f to that. This is composition is written with a little circle, f composed with x, prime of t. And in this notation, what the chain rule looks like is you take the derivative of the outside function, leaving the inside stuff exactly how it was, but then you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside stuff. So this. So there are two different ways of writing the chain rule in single variable calculus. What happens in multivariable calculus? Well, it's, um, you'll see that it's analogous to that in some ways. It looks similar in some ways, but just different enough to be confusing. So suppose, just as a, an example with enough variables in it to make it clear what happens in general, Suppose f is a function of three variables. Uh, the chain rule applies to any number of variables, but let's just start with three. And, but suppose each one of those is a function of two other variables, s and t. So x is some function of s and t. y is a function of s and t. And z is a function of s and t. Uh-huh. So then if you plug in what x, y, and z are in terms of s and t, you could write f as a function of s and t, which means you could ask for two partial derivatives of f. You could ask, well, what's the partial derivative of f with respect to s, and what's the partial derivative of f with respect to t? And what your hope is that it sort of looks like the, I don't know, in some way analogous to the chain rule for a single variable function. You want to write these in terms of partial derivatives of f with respect to x, y, and z, and partial derivatives of x, y, and z in terms of s and t. And that is what the chain rule gives you. It tells you that this is the partial of f with respect to x times the partial of x with respect to s. I'm going to try to explain how you should, how you can remember this. Um, so it looks like this. All right, before I write the partial derivative of f with respect to t, let me point out what I was just doing. f is a function of, is explicitly a function of x, y, and z, and you have those partial derivatives here, here, and here. Partial derivative of f with respect to x, partial derivative of f with respect to y, and the partial derivative of f with respect to z. And then what do you multiply each of those terms by? You multiply by what you would have to multiply by so that if algebraic cancellation of fractions was going on, or were going on, so here's a partial derivative with respect to x, partial with respect to x. If you think of those as canceling, 
you get the parcel of f with respect to s, which is what you're after. Same thing here. If the parcels with respect to y canceled, you'd be getting the parcel of f with respect to s. Same thing here. So you write the parcel derivatives of f with respect to the variables it explicitly depends on, and then you multiply by whatever you have to multiply by, so that if algebraic cancellation were going on, you would get the thing you're after each time. Understand, algebraic cancellation can't be what's really going on, because if you really got the partial of f with respect to s each place, this side would be three times that side, and it's not. So algebraic cancellation is not, is not what's happening, but if you think about it that way, that, oh, it helps you remember what you're supposed to multiply by each time. If you followed that, you ought to be able to figure out what goes here for the partial of f with respect to t. You put the partial derivatives of f with respect to each of the variables that explicitly depends on. But then each time you have to multiply by what you'd think you'd have to multiply by so that if cancellation were going on, you'd end up with this. So here you need to wipe out that partial with respect to x in the denominator and have a partial with respect to t. Here you partial of y with respect to t. Here the partial derivative of z with respect to t. So this is what the multivariable chain rule says um, in the notation with the round d's in it. If you want something analogous to the prime notation, notice that this is the those three numbers, partial of f with respect to x, partial of f with respect to y, partial of f with respect to z, is the gradient vector of f at x, y, z. And then what have you dotted? And then there's a dot product going on of that with a vector. What's that vector? It's x, y, z, but always with the partial with respect to s. So it's the partial derivative with respect to x, s, of the x, y, z vector. So this is the closest thing we have to the prime notation for the chain rule. It's you take the gradient vector of the function, and then you take the dot product with the partial derivative of the vector function, x, y, z. So this is what the chain rule says. Um, I assume that, well, hopefully from this, it's clear what you would do in general. If you had f as a function of any number of variables x, so that could be any number of variables, and x itself is a multi-component function of some t variables, then what the chain rule says is the partial derivative of f with respect to any one of the t variables is just, you take the partial derivative of f with respect to each x variable, multiply by the corresponding derivative of that x variable with respect to your fixed t variable, and add all of those together. And what you get is that it's the gradient vector of f at x dotted with the partial derivative with respect to ti of the x vector. All right, that is the multivariable chain rule. It's, uh, I don't know, it's a little more complicated than the single variable chain rule. It's not too difficult to remember. Um, let's look at some examples. We'll start with something fairly easy. So, let's look at g of xy is x times y, but x is a function of two variables, u and v. And y is a function of two variables, u and v. All right. And I want to calculate the partial derivative. So 
g is explicitly a function of x and y, but x and y are functions of u and v. What we'd like to look at is the partial derivative of g with respect to u and the partial derivative of g with respect to v. I'm going to do this two different ways, just so you can kind of compare and see that we get the same thing. I'm going to use the chain rule first, but then I'm actually going to plug x and y in, write g explicitly as a function of u and v, and then take its partial derivatives without using the chain rule, and make sure we get the same thing. If we better, or math isn't working today. All right, let's see if we can fit it right here. With the chain rule, you would get the partial derivative of g with respect to u equals all right, the partial derivative of g with respect to the variables it explicitly depends on, x and y, but then you always multiply by what it looks like you would multiply by so that if these canceled, you got the partial g with respect to u. And then you add, so plus the partial derivative of g with respect to y is the partial derivative of y with respect to u. What do you get for these things? Uh, the partial derivative of g with respect to x is y. The partial derivative of x with respect to u is just 1. The partial derivative of g with respect to y is x. The partial derivative of y with respect to u is 1. So you just get x plus y, but if you, if you want your answer in terms of u and v, then you put back in what y is in terms of u and v. You get u plus v, and then plus x, which is u minus v. The v's cancel, and you get 2u. What's the partial derivative of g with respect to v? Again, it's the partial of g with respect to x times the partial derivative of x with respect to v plus the partial derivative of g with respect to y. It's a partial derivative of y with respect to v. Partial of g with respect to x hasn't changed. It's still y. The partial of x with respect to v is minus 1 plus the partial derivative of g with respect to y. That's still x. The partial derivative of y with respect to v, 1. So now we get minus y. So that is minus u plus v plus u minus v. And now you get minus u minus v plus u, so the u's cancel. You get minus v minus v, so you get minus 2v. Okay. That was using the chain rule both times. Now I just want to explicitly plug x and y in, write g. g is a function of x and y. Uh, sorry, it's a function of u and v. Put in x is u minus v, you get u minus v. Put in y is u plus v. Now you could use the product rule, but if you just multiply this out, it's the difference of squares. This is u squared minus v squared. And so the partial derivative of g with respect to u is certainly 2u, and the partial derivative of g with respect to v is minus 2v. So yeah, of course, we get the same thing either way. Um, notice that in the chain rule, your answer kind of comes out naturally involving x and y, and usually it would involve x, y, u, and v. And if you want everything to be in terms of u and v, you need to replace the x's and y's after you've done the chain rule with u and v. Um, this example may look the chain rule, may make the chain rule look like it's not useful. It made things more complicated. That's not true in general. Um, frequently, it's much more complicated to plug in um, and, then, and then just take partial derivatives. Chain rule actually breaks things up into manageable pieces. Sometimes the data you're given doesn't allow you to explicitly plug in. You kind of are forced to use the chain rule. Let's look at three more examples, and we'll see what happens. So 
So here's an example which really requires the chain rule. Um, suppose t is some function of u, v, and w. But u is, so, so suppose, t is some function of u, v, and w. u is r cosine of t. v is 5r minus 3t. And w is r squared e to the t. Uh, also suppose that the gradient vector of t at minus, uh, no, at 2, 10, 4 is minus 1, 3, 2. What is the question or the command? Calculate the partial derivative of t with respect to r at uv equals 2, 0. And the partial derivative of capital T with respect to little t when uv is 2, 0. All right. Um, before I actually start calculating, a number of little comments. Notice that you are not given a formula for t in terms of uv and w. So there's no hope of plugging in what uv and w are into the function and taking derivatives, just ordinary partial derivatives. There's no hope of doing that. You're going to have to use the chain rule. It may not even be clear to you initially that there's enough data here to answer this question. Um, and even if it's clear to you that there's enough data, it may not necessarily look like the right data. Um, so uh, this should not be, this should be, sorry, that's not u and v is 2, 0 and both times. That's r and t. These are the rt values. Yes, that would have been a bad mistake. That's 2 and 0 what r and t are, not what u and v are. But if I were going to specify what u and v are, I'd have to specify what w was, and this data is u is 2, v is 10, w is 4, so yeah, 2, 0 wouldn't have been good for that. Um, all right, uh, yes, so what I was going to say, and I'm glad I was going to say it because it made me catch that, um, notice that I, I do indicate that this is the rt value down here is 2, 0, because you don't want to confuse it with, if I just put 2, 0, and capital T were only a function of two variables, you might think, oh, those are the values of those two variables or these two variables. So your goal is to be clear. So yeah, it's kind of annoying to have to write this extra RT equals, but just go ahead and write it. Okay, um, what better be true uh, for us to be able to do this problem is that when RT is two zero, UV and W are exactly 2, 10, and 4. Otherwise, our data isn't what we need for the chain rule. But let's, let me write the chain rule in the gradient vector form, and then <clears throat> we'll see that what data we really need. So in gradient vector form, remember that the chain rule says the partial derivative of capital T with respect to R should be the gradient vector of T dotted with, so at uvw, dotted with the partial derivative with respect to r of the uvw vector, or multi-component function. Um, and the partial derivative of t, with capital T with respect to little t, should also be the gradient vector of capital T at uvw, but now dotted with the other partial derivative, the partial derivative with respect to t of uvw. So if we want to calculate this partial these partial derivatives, 
when RT is 2, 0, what we need here and here is exactly the gradient vector evaluated at the point, at the UVW point, where RT is 2, 0. So you do have to plug in R is 2 and T is 0 and see what UV and W are. Let me see if I can put that right here. If RT is 2, 0, what do you get for you? For you, you get 2 times the cosine of 0. So u is 2 times the cosine of 0. The cosine of 0 is 1, so this is 2. v is when r is 2 and t is 0, you get 5 times 2 minus 0, so we get 10. Good. We're getting 2, 10. And we should check w when when r is 2 and t is 0, you get 4 times e to the 0. That's 1, so you just get 4. So yes, when rt is 2, 0, uvw is 2, 10, 4. Good. So that means when you evaluate these at 2, 0, you need 2, 10, 4 right here. And then this we'll have to evaluate. Um, at RT equals 2, 0. And similarly here you get when RT is 2, 0, you get the gradient vector at 2, 10, 4. And then of course you have to evaluate this when RT is 2, 0. Okay, but you do those things. And you get what you get. Let's see what you get. <coughs> okay, so you're given the gradient vector at 2, 10, 4. It's minus 1, 3, 2. All right. What we need at this point to do the two dot products that we had over there, we need the partial derivatives with respect to R and T of the triple UVW, so the UVW vector, the UVW multi-component function. So let me write UVW is, I'm just rewriting what UV and W are, R cosine of T. V is 5R minus 3T, and W is R squared E to the T. Okay, so the partial derivative with respect to R of UVW, so partial derivatives with respect to R, you get the cosine of T, 5 2r e to the t. The partial derivative with respect to t of uvw. All right, here's uvw, the partial derivative with respect to t. You get a minus r sine of t, a minus 3, and the derivative e to the t with respect to t, e to the t. The r squared goes along for the ride. So you get that. But we need these evaluated at RT equals 2, 0. So, so let me just write at RT equals 2, 0. What we're getting here in this line is, all right, R is 2, T is 0, so the cosine of 0, 1. Uh, 5 sits there happily being 5. So this is this. Um, R is 2, T is 0, so here we get 4. This, when R is 2 and T is 0, well, T is 0, this is sine of 0, so that part is 0. Minus 3 is minus 3. 
and here we get four. All right, so um, what do we get for our final answer? Well, the partial derivative of capital T with respect to R, when RT is two zero, we had it's the gradient vector, so it's this. So it's minus one, three, two, dotted with this, the partial of UVW with respect to R. So that is one, five, four. And we get minus one plus 15 plus eight. So that is 22. And the partial derivative of t with respect to little t at rt equals 2, 0. Oops. It's the same gradient vector, minus 1, 3, 2, dotted with the other partial derivative, so dotted with 0, minus 3, 4, so we get 0 minus 9 plus 8, so minus 1. So that's what the chain rule gives you. And there was no way to do this problem without the chain rule. There was no function for us to plug into um, to avoid the use of the chain rule. All right, let's look at, I don't know, a more complicated chain rule without numbers in it. Um, because there's a point I want to make, and then we'll look at one physical example. Okay, ah, uh, I see that I see that my answer on this sheet does not match my answer on the board, but I think my answer on the board is right. So, um, all right. Yes. All right. Yes. I need to correct that in the textbook. All right. Let's look at another example. Let's let f of x, y be x squared, y plus x, y cubed. But now let's suppose x is 5s squared plus 7st and that y is 3st plus 4t squared. Okay. x squared y, y is yes. All right. This is a polynomial in two variables. These are polynomials in two variables. It wouldn't be that difficult to plug in what x and y are in terms of s and t and then take the partial derivatives with respect to s and t, it would look fairly ugly because you'd have a function of s and t here, a function of s and t quantity squared here, a function of s and t here, a function of s and t here, quantity cubed. The, the formula would come out fairly, the formulas for the partial derivatives would come out fairly long. And a lot of the parts of what's making it long would be able to be simplified and pulled out and regrouped in nice ways. The chain rule kind of um, breaks things up for you, gives, it, gives things to you in manageable chunks in the first place. So let's just not, I'm not going to plug in what x and y are in terms of s and t and calculate that way. I'm just going to use the chain rule. What is the partial derivative of f with respect to s? It is the partial of f with respect to x 
times the partial derivative of f, x with respect to s, plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y, times the partial derivative of y with respect to s. It looks like right, y is explicitly a function of x and y, so you have those partial derivatives. Then you multiply by what you need to multiply by so that if algebraic cancellation were going on each time, you would have what you're after, the partial derivative of f with respect to s, and then you add. So this is easy to calculate. Partial derivative of f with respect to x, 2xy plus y cubed. Partial derivative of x with respect to s is um, 10s plus 7t. Um, the partial derivative of f with respect to y is x squared plus 3xy squared. Then the partial derivative of y with respect to s is 3t, and then the partial derivative of this with respect to s is 0. So you just get that for the partial derivative of f with respect to s. Partial derivative of f with respect to t, you get the partial derivative of f with respect to x plus the partial derivative of x with respect to t, plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y, plus the partial derivative of y with respect to t. And so, again, the uh, partials with respect to x and y look the same. You get 2xy plus y cubed. But now times the partial derivative of x with respect to t, that is 7s, and then plus this partial derivative, partial derivative of f with respect to y, and then times the partial derivative of y with respect to t. So times a 3s plus 8t. Right. We are finished calculating these partial derivatives. I say finished, and this is all I want to do in this example. But in other problems, it's unclear that you'd be finished, because maybe you want the whole thing in terms of s and t. If you want everything in terms of s and t at this point, you need to take this expression for x, this expression for y, and put those in here and here to get everything in terms of s and t, and, and also put them in here and here to get everything in terms of s and t. But it's still true that this would split up the partial derivatives in kind of nice ways, um, nicer than if you plug in x and y in the beginning and took partial derivatives. Um, in other problems, it, like when in the last one we did where we had specific numbers to plug in, if you had specific, a specific s and t value, rather than plug in what x and y are in general and get some nasty expression in terms of s and t both times, if you could just leave things split up, have the partial of f with respect to s given by this, partial of f with respect to t given by this, and keep in mind that x and y are this in terms of s and t. Then if you're given an st value where you want to calculate something, you plug that in here, get a number for it. So you're given s and t numbers. You plug those in here, get an x number, plug those in here, get a y number, and then in these two partial derivatives, every place you see x and y, you plug in the numbers, and every place you see s and t, you plug in the numbers you were given. So you don't necessarily always want to get everything in terms of these kind of starting variables. It just depends on the problem. All right, I want to look at one um, last example, at least in this basics part of the section. And it's a physical example. It may not seem so basic because I'm going to use an, the term electric potential. Don't, don't be scared. If you don't know what electric potential means, it doesn't matter. It, I'm going to give you a function that gives the electric potential, and we're going to ask for its rate of change. Um, well, then you calculate the rate of change of the electric potential. It may not have any physical meaning for you if you don't know what electric potential is, but that's fine. All right. In this example, well, let me, I'll, I'll say it after I write the example. So 
example. So, suppose that a particle is moving through space. And that, at time t equals 2 seconds, the particle is at a point 347, and then particle is at 347, so all the distances in this probably going to be measured in meters, and is moving with velocity, so this is an instantaneous velocity, minus 2, 1, 5, meters per second. Suppose there is an electric potential in space. given by phi of xyz, so the electric potential at point xyz is xy minus z squared volts, where x, y, and z are still in meters, determine instantaneous rate of change. Of the electric potential. At the particle, or oh, sorry electric potential at the particle's location or position at time t equals two seconds. All right. Well, it took longer to write that than it'll take to, <laughs> to do the problem, but so here it is, electric potential, it's measured in volts. Um, in uh, chapter four, when we get to, to uh, vector fields and more on gradient vectors, we will see that the gradient vector um, of the electric potential at every point gives you something called a vector field, and that field is called the electric field. Um, and really, a potential functions like this are only defined up to addition of a constant um, but, uh, so, really picking a specific one means you've taken some specific location as having electric potential zero. But, that is irrelevant. As I said, for, for, for better or for worse, having any physical, knowing physically what electric potential is, is irrelevant to doing the problem. You're given the function that gives it to you, and you want its instantaneous rate of change. So, um, so the x, y, and z functions are functions of time. We are looking at the change in the electric potential at the particle's position. So <clears throat> we have the particle's position changes with time. 
it's x is some function of t, y is some function of t, and z is some function of t. And so if you want, there's the position function or position vector that's x of t, y of t, z of t. Right? This is the position, a lot of people would say vector. If you prefer thinking of it as a multi-component function, that's fine. The position vector. The velocity, um, if you're thinking of it as a vector, you might want to put a little vector arrow over it instead of underlining like I do for multi-indexed things. Um, the velocity, now I really do want to think velocity vector is the derivative of the position. I guess I'll write this as a vector. The derivative of the position vector. And what we're told is that, so this is particle's position, this is the particle's velocity. What we're told explicitly is that the position at time 2 is 3, 4, 7. Everything's in meters and seconds and volts. We'll keep the units in mind and put them in in the final answer, unless I forget. Um, and that the velocity at time 2 is minus 2, 1, 5. So that's what we're told. What are we after? We're after the instantaneous rate of change. So with respect to, uh, I didn't say with respect to time, but I meant with respect to time. I don't think I wrote it. Yeah. What's the instantaneous rate of change of the electric potential with respect to time? Um, all right. So you take the derivative with respect to time of what? Well, really, it's the electric potential function evaluated at the particle's position. So here is a composition. Now, I've written an ordinary derivative here because p is a function of just time. And then that means when we compose, we end up with a function of just time. So, tip, so since there's just one variable, you would typically write a standard derivative. But when a function is a function of just one variable, the standard derivative is the same as the partial derivative. And so don't think that the chain rule says anything different here. It says the same thing. It's just that you try to write normal d's and normal derivatives if you know that something's a function of one variable. But what the chain rule says is what it said before. This is the gradient vector of the outside function evaluated at p of t dotted with the partial derivative of this inside vector function. So dotted with the partial derivative with respect to t of this p vector. But p only depends on t. And so yes, you don't have to write partial derivatives there either. I mean, you, it's not wrong to write them. You just It's a little misleading. It makes people think. But this is the derivative of the position vector, so you get the velocity vector. So. <clears throat> yeah, it's a little misleading to write partial derivatives when something's a function of a single variable. Um, but it's not wrong. And so we get this formula. The derivative of the electric potential at the position of the particle is the gradient of the potential at the point dotted with the velocity vector. We want everything at time 0 then we just do everything, uh, not at time zero, at time two, then we just do everything at time two. The derivative then, the instantaneous rate of change, P of t at t equals two, you get the gradient vector of phi of the position at time two dotted with the velocity at time two. But we're given both of those because we know the position at time 2 is um, 3, 4, 7. 3, 4, 7. And the velocity vector at time 2 is minus 2, 1, 5. 
So we get this, what's, what's left for us to do? We still have to calculate the gradient vector of phi at 3, 4, 7. But that's not bad, so we just do that. Here, we have to use what we're given for phi. We haven't used that yet. Not surprisingly, we have to use it at some point. Although, in some devious problems, people give you information that you don't have to use, just so you can use what you're given as a hint for what you need. So, but not this time. We have that. And we know that what we're after, the derivative with respect to t of phi of p of t, at t equals 2, is the gradient of phi at 3, 4, 7, the gradient vector of phi, 3, 4, 7, dotted with minus 2, minus 1, 5, I feel like I just changed that vector on the fly. Uh, I put in a minus one where there wasn't one before. I don't know why. <laughs> Glad I looked. Uh, our velocity vector wasn't minus two, minus one, five. It's minus two, one, five. I don't know where that extra minus sign came from. And we need the gradient vector phi at three, four, seven. So, uh, the gradient vector of phi, partial with derivative with respect to x, is y. The partial derivative with respect to y is x. The partial derivative with respect to z is minus 2z. So the gradient vector of phi at 3, 4, 7 is, so the y-coordinate goes first, so it's 4, and the x-coordinate, 3, then you plug in z is 7, so minus 14. And so we get 4, 3, minus 14, dotted with minus 2, 1, 5. This is minus 8, plus 3, minus 70. So I get minus 75 units. Well, whether, I mean, you should know the units. This is volts and seconds. So this is volts per second. Um, if you wanted to see that from the gradient vector, the gradient vector, this would have been in volts, but then we took partial derivatives with respect to um, position measurements. So this would have been in volts per meter, but this was in, this is velocity, so this was meters per second. So then the meters cancel and you're left with volts per second, whichever way you do it. All right, so that's what you get. Um, the chain rule is very useful, um, both for calculating complicated partial derivatives and for um, evaluating partial derivatives when you're just given data at a particular point, not giving, given formulas. Um, it's of great theoretical importance. We're going to use it throughout the, the rest of the book. So the chain rule is, is certainly the most important thing in this section. Um, in the second portion of the section, the, the more depth, I'll basically redo all of this, but in terms of total derivatives and differentials.